Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's your brother Amir Junaid Muhadif, formerly known as Loon from Bad Boy Records. Right now, I'm chilling with my brother in faith, Big Ed. That's what I call him on the Dean Show. So get your Dean right. You heard? Barakallahu feet. Bismillah, alhamdulillah. Let me give you the best of greetings, the greetings of peace. Peace be unto you. Now, my name is Eddie, and I'm your host of The Dean Show. And I get a chance to sit with a lot of wonderful people, people who have come to acknowledge what the truth is in life. They join this beautiful brotherhood of over 1.5 billion people from all around the world, the fastest growing way of life in the world today. And my next guest is one of those people. Now, he's a unique individual. He's my brother and your brother. And we want to know why this former rapper, hip hop phenomenon, former bad boy, gone good boy, who was with the likes of Sean, P. Diddy, Cones, hanging out with all the celebrities, and he left that life to live this good life, the life that brought him peace. You're going to find out how he attained something that money couldn't buy. I got a chance to sit with him, and I'm very excited to share his story with all of the viewers of The Dean Show this week on The Dean Show. Loon, former bad boy gone good boy. Let's find out why. Enjoy this week's show. Dean, Allah, there's only one God, and Muhammad is his messenger. Allah, la ilaha illallah. Allah. There's only one God and Jesus was his messenger Allah La ilaha illallah I don't know why I did that. Maybe it's just, maybe it's just to break the ice. Assalamu alaikum. Oh, wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be unto you, my brother. Oh, and also with you, Aki. Now, what was the greeting that you used to have before when you used to see some of the homeboys? Um, you know, what up, son? What's good? Yo, <laughs> what up, son? Yo, what's going down? <laughs> now you're saying you're wishing me peace. I'm wishing you peace. It's something Man, new, I'm huh? I'm wishing everybody peace, you know. I mean, Islam has brought peace into my life that I couldn't find, you know, living the lifestyle I was living in the music business. And it feels good to wish peace unto others once I've found the peace for myself. Now, we are excited to hear this story because we get to talk to people who have come from all walks of life. Uh, you know, people have this misnotion that Islam is something just for the Arabs. Yeah. But when they see uh, an American who used to be a, or someone who is an icon, people are looking up to you, you're singing with Pete Diddy and the, the Bad Boy crew, is that what they're yeah, called? Yeah, Bad Boy Records, Bad Boy Entertainment, you know, P. Diddy, Sean Combs, Sean John, you know. You know, I ran with an entrepreneur. I, I ran with an icon in the music business, and I was exposed to so many things in such a like short period of time. The success of the records that I did with Puff, you know, propelled to be in you know audiences all around the world. It wasn't a country that I couldn't go to that the per a person couldn't identify with who I was or the songs I created or the records I partaked in. And, and you know, it was just, it's just an overwhelming feeling to be embraced by such a vast audience. But you know, to become a Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has definitely replaced that audience, you know what I'm saying, with a, a whole different light. You know, it's a whole different thing. And the transition has been so beautiful. You know, Allah is most kind. You know, the brothers and sisters that I used to, you know, run with in the music business have embraced my um, conversion to Islam. You know, my family has, you know, embraced my conversion to Islam. And just it's just been smooth sailing, man. Allah is most kind because it's something that I really needed, you know. And I think a lot of entertainers in that business are searching for the same peace, you know. May Allah guide them all. Let's talk a little bit about the past. We're not going to go into any details yeah. or anything, but for the benefit of those who are still trying to chase what you were living, they call it the American dream. Yeah. People see the videos yeah. and they see all the rides and they yeah. see the women and the glamour and the glitz. Yeah. But it's not all that. Well, for the most part, I think that a lot of people, you know, mainly, you know, preferably the youth, you know, we all share kind of the same common desires and temptations. And I think the music business kind of breeds these things and it gives people a one-dimensional perception 
of you know the, mostly the perks in the business yeah. so to say and i think that you know the youth by being so inspired all around the world you know what I'm saying being so inspired by this lifestyle a lot of them who have been born into certain faiths you know what I'm saying like islam and, and things of that nature, you know, they try to incorporate this lifestyle into something that's so beautiful. You know, saying Islam is just so beautiful. And I've been seeing over the years how, you know, this, this business and this lifestyle has affected so many of the youth. And myself, I think that traveling the world and living this consistent pattern of doing so many sinful things, you know, that come with the business. You know, we actually, you know, have the opportunity to make songs that might not be so vulgar might not be so, you know, you know, negative. Mm -hmm. But the reality of it is there's a lifestyle that comes with it. And that was the thing that really plagued my life because what you're propelled in based on the success, you know, is a lifestyle that just becomes so repetitive and so consistent and you find yourself being removed further and further away from a truth, further and further away from peace, further away from anything that was pure about you before you entered the business. So like I said, you know, on the outside, everything looks good. You see the $100,000 cars. You see a lot of diamonds. You see, you know, for men, for the sake of men, you see a lot of females. And they think that this is, you know, this is a life. This is, this is like, you know, paradise right here on earth. But the reality of it is, you know, I couldn't purchase peace. You know, I was probably able to buy a car, buy a house, buy a chain. Couldn't purchase peace. And the reality of it is, while we're sitting here, while I'm sitting here constantly paying for the disease, the cure was free. Paying for the disease. Paying for the disease. And the cure is free. And the cure is free. Why are people running away from something that's free to something that's expensive? Because you got to pay for the martinis yeah. and the, I forgot what's even drunk in the club nowadays, the, the Dom Perignons, yeah. and you got to pay for all these things. And But you can get yeah. some water easy, like, yeah. you know? <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like, I think people treat life like the flu shot. You think you can treat the flu with the flu. Yeah. It's not like that, you know what I'm saying? And what happened was, you know, Allah's guidance is just amazing because I think sincerely in my heart, Allah heard me and heard the oppression that, that, that's hidden, you know what I'm saying, from a lot of us entertainers. You know, we try to forge this image and we try to forge this character that's, you know what I'm saying, like suitable for the fan. The fan admires this character, they're drawn to this character, but the reality of it is, we face tragedies no different from normal people. But the reality of it is, we try to go past that and continue to feed the fan, you know, this impression that they desire and that, and that they gravitate to. But me on the other hand, you know, it just got to a point where it was just getting very overwhelming, it was getting very overbearing, and I just found myself searching inside like man i need an answer i need something that's going to give me a, a a route to just you know alleviate some of these pains and i would try all kinds of things you know sometimes you just be like yo listen i'll just go buy me a hot car maybe i feel better you know maybe if i go buy a chain you know maybe if i go to the spa for about five hours we'll get a seaweed bath and all the you know the whole crazy stuff and then you know you get one phone call next thing you know you got not seeing back again or you drive the car, you know all the features in the car is no fun no more. Or you wear the chain and after a while the chain is just kind of boring because, you know, everything upgrades as you go. And I found myself like I can't find peace chasing this methodology. So what happened, I was fortunate to do a, a song with an artist from Canada, you know, a brother named Masari. He was a um, Lebanese artist. And when I did the song, the song didn't really do good in the States. But it kind of propelled into a market that I never knew even existed. Mm -hmm. And it was in the Muslim market, in the Islamic market. And what happened was I, I got, you know, called to do shows in like Muscat, Oman, Dubai, Abu Dhabi, and things of this nature. Even I, I performed in Kazakhstan. I performed in a lot of countries, even in West Africa. And I found myself running to Islam, keep running into Islam. And once you get past the whole little butterflies and the things that come with the, um, you know, the entertainment aspect, I started to get drawn to other things that came with my journey. And that was the, like the van being called. The van being called in the city, like just rang through the whole city. Everybody would just stop. You could hear people breathing. This is like, this is a song that I heard that was more beautiful than any song I've ever wrote in my life. That's the Muslim call to prayer. The Muslim call to prayer, you know. Yeah. And then, like I said, at some point, you find yourself trying to shop 
within between Lor and Asa. Everyone's taking the sun in that. Mm -hmm. You know, I come from New York City. Everything is 24 hours. I've never seen anybody shut down in midday. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And all this is for the sake of Allah. All this is for the sake of God. And it's like, this was so consistent. You know, every place I went, I just seen this whole consistent practice of worshiping the one true God. And this was something that I was looking for. This is something I wanted to be a part of because there's a lot of inconsistency the way people practice and worship, you know, saying God. And what I saw in the Muslim was very consistent. And I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't tear myself away from it. After a while, I started to see and study, ask questions. I would go to certain bookstores, buy books, and just found myself getting more and more drawn to trying to learn this culture and learn this lifestyle and learn this religion. <clears throat> so while I was in the UAE, I found myself, you know, pretty much, you know, at the last leg of this whole party thing and, you know, I actually seen the sunrise while I was in Abu Dhabi and um, I was staying at the Emirates Palace. And I watched the sunrise and I'm looking at the Arabian Sea and I'm just saying to myself, like, this is just beautiful, man. This is just beautiful. And it's like all the misconceptions that you see in the media about the Muslim, you know, all of these things were quickly getting dispelled, you know. And I start seeing, like, maybe the media is only, you know, Establishing 3% of Islam Because everywhere I'm going I'm seeing just the exact opposite I'm seeing streets you can eat off I'm seeing people who hospitality is just amazing Everywhere you go Someone's offering you tea Someone's offering you dates Someone's offering you help You know people that are, are very less fortunate Than the people that I used to hang with I'm hanging with multi-millionaires They got yachts You know what I'm saying Mansions, penthouses and things of this nature And it's hard to even extract a, a cold soda from them mm -hmm. You know And then to be around people who who, who really didn't have much, who were always willing to give, you know, and, not, and want nothing in return, you know, because they feel that their blessings come from Allah. And that's a concept that I, I could incorporate in my life because I was a given person. I was a person that overasserted myself for the sake of success, for the sake of bringing success to other people, for the sake of helping other people find success. But the benefit at the time, I was looking for the return to come from the people I was helping. But then I learned that that's not where I'm supposed to be looking. I'm supposed to seek refuge in the one that created me. So I found myself, you know, being engulfed by this concept and just being overwhelmed and just, man, blown away. And I say, you know, I want to be a Muslim. Now, did you have any exposure to any other religions, anything else oh, that yeah. you looked into? Can you talk about this briefly? Well, I was born in a Christian household. You know, mm -hmm. my grandmother, she sung in the United Negro College Fund Choir for about 40 years. I used to spend maybe six, seven days a week in the church. And, you know, I was heavy, heavily active in, you know, in Christian activity, you know, saying Bible studies. I played the piano. I played the bells. I was an usher. I did everything that you could possibly do in the, in the infrastructure of, you know, the Baptist church. And, you know, I just started to notice a lot of, you know, inconsistencies, you know, people who say they're of God doing things that are not of God. And it's not that, you know, because even in Islam, you're not supposed to judge the Muslim, you know, judge Islam by the Muslim. Yeah. So I'm not saying that I was judging the Christian by, you know, but the reality of it was it was so repetitive, the inconsistencies and in how things were practiced and how things were done. And I really started to ask questions, you know, because you have people that, you know, believe that Jesus is God. And I used to ask myself as a child, how is Jesus God if he prays? Who's he praying to? Mm -hmm. And there's just certain little questions that I wanted answers for that I couldn't find within the infrastructure. It's a good so. question. Who was he praying to? That's what you're saying? Yeah, saying. exactly. Like, these are, these are like common sense questions. Mm -hmm. These are not something that really take rocket science. Yeah. And, you know, and it, even like with Adam and Eve, I'm like, how are we held accountable for the sins of two, like the first, you know, man and woman created, like, how am I, like, why am I to blame? I never met Adam, I never met Eve. Why would I be held accountable? That would make God unjust. You know, when we know that God is so merciful and God is the most just. So these are just little questions that I kept, you know, wanting answers for and I couldn't find it within the infrastructure. It was always like a brush off, a shut down. And, and it's like, you know, if I can't find the answers, you know, and the faith that I'm practicing, maybe I need to outsource, you know? And I found myself searching, not really looking for Islam, but you know, 
I love my family, you know, they, they still, you know, have, you know, they still definitely practice Christian faith. And it hasn't changed my relationship with none of the people that I love. But the reality is I found something for me. And the piece that I found, I try to share, you know, I'm very patient with the people I love. And, you know, Islam is not something that you force upon somebody because it wasn't forced on me. I was fortunate to find Islam without no dawah. No one sat down and talked to me about Islam. So I know that I was guided here purely by Allah subhanahu wa you know, ta'ala's will. I found Islam, you know, and, you know, coming out of the Christian life was definitely a big transition. But the reality of it is, it wasn't that much of a transition because there are a lot of things that will lead you to an understanding of Islam. And back, Islam clarifying a lot of things that I needed to know about Christianity. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a nutshell, you just, you know, you go where it gives you more. Mm -hmm. And I found more in Islam. You found all the rational, logical evidence. Everything, your questions clear. were answered, clear proofs. Clear. Clear. No ambiguity. Everything is straightforward. Everything clear. What your purpose of life is. Clear. What happens when you die. Clear. Where you're going. Clear. Everything is lucid. Check. Check. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Tell, tell us now. People want to know, like, okay, you're hanging out with P. Diddy and some of the other rappers. Party is over. Lights are on. Did you ever have one of these conversations like, you know what? This is getting played out, man. Very We've much had so. everything. Very much so. Talk to us. Share Very much so. I would say, you know, you find yourself, and like in my case, you know, being that I targeted the females as an audience. And at the time, you know, I have a lot of women in my family. So I have a lot of respect for women. So the most righteous effort that I found myself trying to achieve was not glorifying the harsh realities that, you know, plagued me in my neighborhood, born and raised in Harlem. It's like, I didn't elaborate on those things. I chose to, to exercise a more brighter side of myself. And that was like, you know, talking about things that revolve around relationships with females and basically the desires of most men at the time when I was in my state of ignorance, you know, trying to find a girl, trying to find, you know, companionship and things of this nature without the whole slander and vulgar stuff that, you know, are, are drawn towards women. So at the time, that was like my most righteous attempt. But what happened is I started to get women that would submit to my success. And after a while, I found myself losing the respect that I have for all the women in my life and all the women in my family based on the way how women will su submit themselves. You know, this is not, you know, someone that's saying you need to talk to my father first or come meet the family. These are women that are just skipping A, B and going straight to C. So I'm like, wow, is this, is this, is this what comes with this? Because it was a time I was really searching for a girl. I really wanted companionship. And what I found was just an obsession with my success. Is that where the song came in, I Need a Girl? Well, actually, it stemmed from, you know what I'm saying, just having that experience of searching for a girl. But at the time, Puff had a serious breakup with Jennifer Lopez. And it all just kind of tied in. It was mm -hmm. something that was you know, happening in his life currently and something that happened in my life before. And we put our heads together and we came up with the concept of, let's just flat out get it off our chest. We need a girl. Now you can sing something like, possibly, I need a wife. You know, for the brothers, exactly. when they get them married, because Islam obviously encourages this to be with them. Exactly. Woman, but the way that is pleasing to the creator in marriage. Exactly. And yeah. that's what I'm trying to say. I was getting to the point where it's like the females, you start to realize, hey, after, you know, everything is said and done, you're trying to find the most polite way to remove this, you know, sister out of your life. Mm -hmm. because what's done is done and you know everything is cool but at that point you start to realize listen this is someone's sister mm -hmm. this is someone's daughter this is someone's mother mm -hmm. so like you said marriage is very important it's something that alleviates all these desires it's something that alleviates all of these actions and then you can quickly expunge some of the desires of the women that might be you know you know drawn to you mm -hmm. like sister I'm married mm -hmm. That kills a lot, you know what I'm yeah. saying? That stops a lot, and, 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 and it alleviates the harm for both parties. Mm -hmm. I'm married. I can't condone these type of things. You know I'm married. I know you don't want to deal with a guy that's married. Cool. What advice do you have? Because we know a lot of people that, like you said earlier, Islam is clear. All the evidence is there. Yeah. But the desire, the desire of wanting success, 
what we supposedly look at success like the lifestyle that you were living people mm -hmm. paint that as okay that's the ultimate success and people now will have those moments that they dig deep down inside and they know look I'm not happy but they get caught up with the cars they get caught up with the money and everyone is going through this how do you break through that and not I, submit to your desires but submit to the so one exactly I would say find success in Allah but the reality of it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has replaced everything that was in my life that was haram and gave me things that are halal. For instance, my phone used to ring a lot. Nothing but haram. Nothing but issues that deal with, dealt with haram. Tell us, we have a lot of non-Muslims watching. You, you said a couple Arabic words. So they don't, so they don't oh, have to take an Arabic oh, class. Haram, <laughs> prohibited. Prohibited, meaning, Yeah, meaning no good. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Not allowed. And halal, meaning permissible, yeah. meaning that it is allowed. So I would get plenty of phone calls from people who would want to indulge in things that were haram. Now my phone rings, I find myself giving the brother salams. That peace that we that gave That peace, that greeting that we gave each other. Yeah. And not only that, I find myself doing things that yeah. are halal. You know what I'm saying? Like talking to people who might be interested in Islam and trying to guide them to a, a better understanding of what Islam is through my example and through, you know, what was given to me. And also just, you know, eating halal, you know uh -huh. what I'm saying? Eating better, you know, I don't eat food that's, you know, not permissible. I eat food that's halal, you know, stay away from pork, stay away from things, you know. And it's just, Allah has gave me the audience that I had before. You know, I still have the same young brothers and sisters that was intrigued by my musical career and now all of them has embraced me as a brother of Islam. I have more siblings now than I've ever had in my life, you know what I'm saying? And I've, I've, I've been a part, been embraced by a brotherhood that surpasses any like temporary relationship I might have had with anybody that was in the business with me or anybody that I grew up with in the street, you know? And not to discredit any of my relationships, but the reality of it is Allah has removed a lot of these things that caused me harm and placed me in harm and danger. And now I just live a very free, peaceful life and I wouldn't give this up for nothing in the world. No money can buy what you have now. No money can buy. Peace and contentment. Like I said, the cure is free. You're paying for the disease. Tell us, have you gotten a chance to interact with some of the people from Bad Boy Records, Puff Daddy? Have you gotten, have they said, what happened, brother? Have you got a chance to share this wonderful story well, I with them? I bumped into Puff a couple months ago, Buster Rhyme, who's also a Muslim, Ray Kwan, who's also a Muslim. And it seemed like a reunion, because everyone was there, Jay-Z, Q-Tip, Puff. It just seemed like a reunion. But it was so funny, because I stood there for a while, and nobody noticed me, because I had grew my beard out, mm -hmm. and, you know, I'm just standing in the cut. But when I met Puff, you know, we laugh and chuckle. We have a brotherhood that's still, you know what I'm saying, we have a relationship. They're still there, you know what I'm saying? We've done a lot of things together, and I think he was very receptive to what I was, you know, upon. And at the same token, it's always a pleasure to see him, and it's always, you know, you know, a benefit to be around him, because like I said, he's an icon, he's a major influence on a lot of people, and, and, and when the time is right, Allah knows best, you know what I'm saying? Inshallah, yeah. I will be able to, you know, consult him in an environment that's suitable, and maybe one day, inshallah, you never know. Of that, you might become a Muslim. What advice, closing comments, and suggestions for those who are trying to mimic the hip hop phenomenons and people who are in your position? What advice so they don't go ahead and touch the hot stove? You know how you tell a child, yeah. you know, the stove is hot and they just got to go and, and, and burn. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so they don't have to go and take a long journey because death can reach you at any time. Definitely. And maybe you don't come back to where you were, Definitely. you know, to finding that peace. What advice do you Definitely. have? My advice would be, you know, if you're trying to, you know, incorporate a love for music just be mindful that there's a lifestyle that comes with the music that kind of like you know destroys the whole positive effort of trying to just exercise a love for music it kind of cancels out you can't have one without the other you do the music you're going to indulge in the lifestyle that comes with the music and the lifestyle itself is definitely something that you don't want to get involved with because it gets it, it draws the guts out you it draws everything that's pure inside you and it, and, it, and it's just something that you know removes the peace of mind that you might have had before you came into business some people f feel like these desires are going to lead them somewhere but the reality of it is take my advice you know there's going to be a breaking point there's going to be a point where you're going to find yourself overexerted exhausted 
overworked and the benefits are not going to add up. So the reality of it is, you know, don't just take my advice, but try to take my advice. For real, it's, it's serious. Brother, thank you very much for being with us here on the Dean Show. Man, pleasure being you. Man, Eddie, he's a good man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, man. Thank Allah you very continue much. Continue to bless you as he has I mean, by opening your heart and to this wonderful way of life. And I I'd mean, like to thank you for being with us on another episode of The Dean Show. Every week we're here trying to help you understand this beautiful way of life. Beautiful. All the messengers of God, they submitted to the one God. Try to strive to live that good, wholesome life. Try to give birth what's already inside of you, that goodness. Bring it out. Ask for the guidance. It's very simple. Yeah. And the truth shall be made clear. Hopefully we'll see you next time here on The Dean Show. Until then, assalamu alaikum. Peace be unto you. And see what everyone's talking about. Prove. If you find one contradiction, it can't be from God. But the rational idea, the rational explanation is, you do your best. Give up worshiping God is one. I will never give up spreading this message. The, the reality of life usually doesn't sink in until tragedy comes. You get a few bad people, the media grabs a hold of that and spends it the way they want to. If you say that you do not believe in Jesus, you have stepped outside of Islam. You cannot be a Muslim. It is attended our faith to. It's cold, it's late, everybody's sleeping. I arise and ask a lot to forgive me. Oh, Allah, you see. Oh, Allah, you know all the sins I do. I turn to you to forgive my sins and my heart. I'm your sinful slave. You're my loving Lord. I'm the one who runs away. Oh, Allah, guide me.